Why should a listener think about picking up Altair and, and using that library for plotting interactively? I think for most data scientists who need to tell stories with their plots, who need to understand data, I think it's a really good solution. I think the API is really nice and consistent. What made me fall off my seat just a couple of weeks ago was the major visualization library Altair have adopted novels. And so like this, they've made NumPy optional, Pandas optional. So for Polos users, they just need this very lightweight library and they can make beautiful, possibly interactive plots. Marco, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. It's awesome to have you here. We're in London, it's sweltering hot. You took the train in from Cardiff to be here. Uh, welcome to the show. I really appreciate you making that trip. So you were introduced to me by Reshma Sheikh, who has recommended many wonderful guests on the show. I said that I was gonna be in London and who should I speak to? She wrote back right away and said, Marco is who you should talk to. Um, and I reviewed your work. I reviewed some of the talks you've done in the past and I couldn't be more excited to be here interviewing you with an episode particularly focused on polars, which I've been excited to learn about for a long time. There also is, there's an interesting connection here uh, in episode number 765, we had your CEO, Travis Oliphant. Um, so we'll talk about your company, Quantsite, later on in the episode. And he's a huge player. He was the originator behind NumPy, behind SciPy. Um, and so maybe someday some of the packages of yours that we'll be talking about today, like Narwhals, <laughs> will also be uh, as invaluable to data scientists. Anyway, that was a long uh, intro welcoming you here. Welcome to the show, Marco. Thank you for having me. Nice, yes. Um, so, Polars, you've been deeply involved in the development and maintenance of popular open source data frame manipulation libraries. So Pandas is probably the one that our listeners are most familiar with. Uh, I think probably anyone who's a hands-on data science practitioner is used to manipulating uh, data frames in the Pandas library in Python. Um, but Polars is increasingly popular and it's developed by Quantsite Labs, actually. It's, uh, I guess, a lot of uh, support for Polars comes from Quantsite Labs. I think I'm the only person in Quantsite Labs who's contributing to Polars. So Polars came out of Richie Vink, who's a developer in the Netherlands. It was originally his is a lockdown project in 2020. And then last year, he started a company around it, uh, imaginatively called Polars. <laughs> um, yes, and it's, I guess the idea of the name Polars is that it comes from like a panda bear and a polar bear. That must be it, right? That's part of it. The other part is that it ends with RS and Polars is written in Rust and the, the file extension for Rust files is typically .rs. Let's actually, because I know Rust is going to be important to this conversation. So uh, tell us a bit about the Rust programming language and why somebody should maybe consider using that programming language over other languages. All right. Yeah, that's a fun one. I started learning Rust not because I particularly want, wanted to learn Rust, but because I wanted to contribute to Polars. Just tried using Polars one uh, Saturday afternoon while procrastinating, procrastinating on some life admin found a little bug, thought it might be fun to fix it, and got a bit addicted to the process. What people usually highlight about Rust that's nice is memory safety. So Rust has some built-in mechanisms which make it quite difficult for you to make certain kinds of mistakes, which are a lot easier to make in certain other kinds of programming languages. It's also got quite a readable syntax, and nowadays, Rust has been, a, it's been around for, I think, at least 10 years. So IDE support is really nice. You get uh, lots of really nice uh, support if you're writing Rust in VS Code. And I think that's why it consistently ranks as one of the most admired languages in the Stack Overflow developer surveys. It does, it does. That I've seen for sure. And so what is it that makes it easier to program in Rust? Um, it's, I've read, I've never, I've never looked at a line of Rust code myself but I've heard that there's things related to it, it compiles very easily, you're very unlikely to, to run into, into programming errors that you put in. Well, it uh, compiles slowly. <laughs> I don't know about uh, easily. In fact, most people, when they try writing Rust, they experience uh, fighting the borrow checker. 
there's rust which enforces certain constraints which make it hard to run into certain kinds of bugs, as you've said, but mm. also it can be certain it can be a bit annoying especially at first when you can't understand necessarily why the compiler is rejecting code which to you looks perfectly safe right. but it's doing you to save you and you really appreciate right. that later like right. w once you get it working you're a lot more confident in what you've written right so it's actually the opposite it isn't that rust compiles easily it's that <laughs> rust compiles with quite a bit of complaining uh, yes. that makes it uh, such a desired language um, so it does the complaining for you instead of, I guess, your downstream users or clients. <laughs> I'd say it's uh, if you're in it for the long run, it's it, it, it's a good choice. If you just need to do some quick uh, experimentation, some quick EDA, maybe not. And I think that leads to one of the design de decisions behind Polars. So Polars is written in Rust, but it's got a Python API. And the idea is that most data scientists should interact with Polars directly through the Python API. That's something they're probably familiar with that can mm -hmm. fit in with the rest of their tool chain. Uh, but development of the library itself happens in Rust. Very cool. Um, so yeah, so back to Polars more specifically. So now we know it's Rust uh, background. We know that even the Rs suffix on it is related to the Rust file names. And so that's clever. Uh, we know that you develop in Rust in order to be developing the Polars library. For somebody who is a data scientist who isn't necessarily a software developer like you are, but for somebody who wants to be taking advantage of Polars, why should somebody install Polars uh, into their Python instance instead of Pandas? I, I hate to give the boring answer of it depends, but that's often the answer <laughs> to lots of technology questions. Yes. So my general advice is if it's not broken, don't fix it. If you've got an existing uh, Pandas project that works absolutely fine for you, then uh, I think there's probably better things for you to focus on than rewriting it in Polars. But if you're starting a new data science project, then that's when I typically recommend people, OK, this is a good time to give Polars a go. I think if you start a new project and you try to think in Polars right from the start, you'll end up writing idiomatic code. And you'll have a lot, a lot of fun, something a lot of Polos users say is that it's surprisingly pleasant to write Polos code, and it's nice to see what the library does for you. The, the syntax is very nice. I think that's one of the major APIs, major innovations that the library has brought, aside from just a phenomenally good implementation. Gotcha. So I, I would have maybe assumed that the API, that the, the syntax would be similar to pandas, but actually what you're saying is it's it's quite different. That's right, yeah. So the idea of trying to re-implement the pandas API, but with a different, faster backend and all of that, it's been tried with varying degrees of success. With Polars, I think this is a really nice success story. Richie just had the courage to try something different, to say, well, you know, Pol uh, pandas, it's uh, successful, it's popular, it does what it does. Let's try doing something different. Let's try not having row labels, like let's just not have an index. I think any of your listeners who are familiar with pandas, most of them are probably used to having to do reset index uh, every two or three lines of pandas code in mm -hmm. order to get things to work. Mm -hmm. There are pandas users who use the index very intentionally and they can make great use of it. You can get performance improvements from using the index very intentionally. But I think the majority of pandas users for them, it's probably more of an annoyance than anything else. And uh, so I think Polos has really made a good design decision here. Like most users don't need to worry about their rows having labels. The a side effect of, of this is that it makes uh, certain performance optimizations easier. And the, the company is now working on distributing Polos. And the company, Quantsight. Sorry, uh, the Polos company. The Polos company. Yeah, exactly. So when it comes to distributing Polos, then it should be easier to do that if you don't have to worry about having an index. Whereas companies that have tried distributing pandas, like Dask, they, they do have an index, but it, uh, it does cause some difficulties. I see, I see. So there is a Polars company that is commercializing the Polars open source library that anybody can access and install. 
Yeah, that's right. So there's a yeah, there's a company that's behind the open source software. Most of the core developers are hired by the company. And so the, the open source software polars is and always will be open source, according to Richie. However, they also they're also going to make some um, some cloud some yeah, some other offerings, like a cloud offering distributed. And these are things that are going to be paid services, and that's what the company is working on. Makes perfect sense. And then so, I maybe hopefully this isn't a controversial question, but Quantside Labs knows that you spend a fair bit of your time on Polar's project, and we have some more questions for you later in the episode on how Quantsight supports their employees splitting time between consulting and open source development, and so. Um, do you know why? Like, do you know why that works so well? Do you know why you get so much support on developing polars? Well, I've brought into the company some clients who have wanted training in polars, both for teaching their employees how to use polars and teaching their employees some more advanced tricks, like how to extend polars with Rust plugins. Uh, we've also had some clients who've specifically wanted help with solutions that have heavily, heavily leveraged uh, polars. So for the company, it works well to say that they've got somebody who's invested in contributing to polars who can help clients. And it works for me if I can do a bit of both. Really happy to have this balance at the moment. Are you stuck between optimizing latency and lowering your inference costs as you build your generative AI applications? Find out why more ML developers are moving toward AWS Trainium and Inferentia to build and serve their large language models. You can save up to 50% on training costs with AWS Trainium chips and up to 40% on inference costs with AWS Inferentia chips. Trainium and Inferentia will help you achieve higher performance, lower costs, and be more sustainable. Check out the links in the show notes to learn more. All right, now back to our show. Awesome. Um, Another aspect of polars that I understand, so you've mostly so far been talking about polars being a great choice for people who want to be manipulating data frames and kind of have more fun, have an easier time with the syntax relative to what they might in pandas. Um, But you've previously, on another interview, you described polars expressions as functions that only take effect once you put them inside the data frame context. Can you provide an example of how this lazy evaluation benefits data processing um, and any kind of maybe concerns people should be concerned about as users when they, when they, when they do evaluate in this way. Ah, oh, that's fantastic, yeah. Expressions, really one of Polar's innovations. Like, I don't think it's something that Polar's invented. Like, PySpark had something similar in uh, some R libraries. I think they had something similar. But the, um, the way they work in Polar's, I think of, a, of an expression as a function from a data frame to a sequence of series. Most users don't think of it in these terms. Most users just think of it as uh, grabbing a column from a data frame and then doing some operation on it. People usually ga- get an intuition for what expressions do fairly quickly. In terms of what advantages, apart from just how nice the syntax is to manipulate, the fact that an expression is just a function, so it doesn't it doesn't need to be evaluated right away. It means that when you've got a data frame context, polars can analyze the different expressions which you've passed in, and it can apply certain, certain optimizations. For example, the classic example that Richie gives is if you're taking a column and uh, doing a sort and then selecting the first five elements, then uh, this has right. got uh, right. n log n complexity, but right. you could just do a top k algorithm and then uh, the complexity there should be linear, I think, something like that. Another example is you might have, you might be doing feature engineering. You might be making two features which both start with something very similar, like, I don't know, take the absolute value of the logarithm of something, and then one feature you're doing like uh, shift one, in the other feature you're doing shift two. You know, people are often making features where part of the calculation is very similar. So then Polars can do common sub, sub, common subplan elimination. It can see that some parts of the expressions are very similar. It can just assign that to a temporary variable, just calculate that once, and then reuse that between the different 
uh, features. Another advantage of using expressions in uh, data frames is that it lends itself very nicely to parallelization. So if you're just making a single operation on a single column, then it's often just not worth, worth it to set up the overhead of doing uh, multi-threading. But if you're calculating, let's say, uh, five different features which are independent of each other, then it, it's quite natural to say, okay, we'll do these five uh, in parallel. And uh, yeah, like this, people can often get like uh, 10, 20, 100x uh, improvements by writing things in polars compared to what they might have got with uh, some other frameworks. Wow, and that, does that include the parallel, like that 10, 50, 100x, that includes the parallelization or? Including everything, so including yeah, yeah. parallelization, including uh, query optimization that we get from doing things lazily, uh, just the whole package. It's, it's going to give you quite a significant advantage, both in terms of runtime and in terms of, terms of memory. Nice. And let me try to break down that lazy term a bit for listeners who might not know it, and kind of maybe in the context of what you just said. So if I were working in an, if, if the code that I was working with was working in an unlazy way, uh, which could be a pandas data frame, and if I have a pandas data frame with only 100 rows or 1,000 rows, and you know, I want to do a sort like you described before I take like you know the top five after a sort with only a hundred rows or a thousand rows in my data frame, I'm not going to notice in in real time. I'm not going to notice any problems with that kind of um, with that kind of evaluation. But if I have a million rows or a billion rows, then that pandas data frame, I'm going to be just sitting there for who knows how long, <laughs> uh, you know, while that sort is, is, while I'm waiting for that sort to actively execute, but with this kind of lazy valuation that is supported by polars behind the scenes. So it doesn't actually execute the code until I ask for some kind of output. And when I ask for that output, there's lots of performance optimizations behind the scenes, like you described in much better detail than I could, but the kind of the net effect is that it means that um, if I need that kind of that sort on a huge data frame to happen, because it's not just um, because it's not actively executed in kind of um, a more simple-minded way, it's lazily executed in a more clever way, and, and so lazy meaning that it doesn't execute until it has to. Um, because of that, lazy doesn't execute until it has to performance optimized behind the scene execution, you get these huge speed ups like you described with the sort scenario, um, you know, to use some computer science terminology, it was a linear uh, increase in, in compute as your data frame gets larger, as opposed to n log n, which is much more, much more, much more computationally expensive when things get larger. Did I do an all right job of kind of, kind of trying to recap what you said there? Yeah, it does. I think you get the spirit of it perfectly. Nice. All right, um, so another, uh, another aspect of polars that allows it to differ from other libraries is uh, that it optimizes string operations in data processing in particular. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Right, we need to make a little pandas and numpy comparison here, so we need to go back in history a bit. Pandas originally built on top of numpy, NumPy did not, has not traditionally had a string data type. They do since NumPy version 2, but traditionally if you wanted to, 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 to store strings and maybe they're of different lengths and all of that, you're going to have to just use an object data type in NumPy. So in object data type, every element is just a pointer to a string and that comes with all kinds of uh, performance and memory uh, footguns. With uh, right, so that's uh, that's the historical part. Then, in pandas, this has traditionally been a bit of a weak point. So I think since pandas one point five, it's been possible to leverage Pyaro to use a specialized string storage. So how that works is there's like a really long string behind the scenes, and for each string in your series. Uh, pandas is recording like where the where 
where the string for that particular row starts and where it ends. And like this, it's, uh, it ends up with better performance and memory uh, characteristics compared to just using the classic object data type NumPy ones. Perlos have taken it even further and they've, they've got a whole different kind of uh, string. They've written a whole blog post about this and that enables uh, further optimizations, especially if you've got repeated strings. So that's, that's the deal. Um, <laughs> Perlos uh, makes, your, makes working with strings really nice. It also just does this natively. You don't need PyArrow installed in order to make use of Polar strings. And I guess one, this is of increasing and increasing importance with how natural language processing is becoming more and more and more of data science. Totally. So there was a time when Travis Oliphant, who we talked about at the outset of the episode, when he would have created NumPy and SciPy, almost everyone who was using Python, I don't have the stats on this, but just based on my experience and seeing what was happening out there, most of the time you're working with tabular data and those tabular data by and large, they were numeric. I mean, for sure with NumPy um, and Pandas was designed to go a bit beyond that and be able to handle lots of different data types um, you know, in, in kind of one matrix structure where you, know, you have one column that's strings, one column that, that's numbers and so on. Um, so more like working with the kind of data that are in a spreadsheet that you might have in Excel. Um, but we're now in this era of data science where natural language processing capabilities are so profound, um, thanks to things like large language models, transformers, generative AI, we have so much more interest in natural language um, processing than ever before. And so it seems to me like having these, this kind of, these string optimizations uh, will come in handy. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, even if you're not working in NLP, if you're working in, in traditional data science, you're probably working with some columns which are strings. Like maybe you've got a column which tells you the name of your vendor or the name of your supplier right. and all of that. You can see the difference that this makes with the TPCH queries. So this is a set of popular da database benchmarks. It's uh, typically written, it's originally written for SQL engines, but it's been adapted to data frames. And you can see the difference of running those in pandas, just uh, classic data types. And then in pandas, where the only difference you make is to use PyArrow strings instead of the classic object data type. And typically, most queries get about twice as fast, even though in those queries, you're not doing anything string specific, like mm. just doing a join that includes string columns, even if you're just uh, comparing two columns for equality. Mm. Any, any, any operation where strings are there in the middle, it uh, benefits from this. Very cool. So there again, you talked about how you can get big performance improvements. You talked about 2x just now, uh, even in situations where you know, there aren't string operations. Um, you talked you know, not long ago in the episode about a 10x, 50x, or even 100x speed up in some situations, thanks to the lazy execution, other optimizations that exist in polars. Do you happen to have um, any kind of specific case studies that come to mind for you where these biggest, where like really big performance changes happened. Um, so, you know, where you're working with large data sets and you leverage polars and rust um, to get a huge uh, performance improvement relative to, you know, if somebody was using, say, pandas or NumPy. You're in luck. I do. <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't prepare him for these questions. So uh, that sounded like it was almost like cheesy and teed up. But. <laughs> No, yeah, I got a case study that's uh, really in my mind for this. I was recently working with a client who had lots of data that they wanted to geocode. Maybe we should explain to the listeners the, pro the meaning of geocoding, reverse geocoding. So geocoding is the practice of when you're given an, an address, you need to determine what's the latitude and longitude of it. And then reverse geocoding, that's the opposite. You're given some latitude and longitude and you want to work backwards and get uh, what's the closest address. So this is something that's used in a variety of sectors from uh, trying to identify landmarks uh, to advertisements. L lots of industries are interested in doing these kinds of operations. And typically, the way you do it is with really big data sets. You've got like big uh, lookup uh, data sets with like lots of addresses. You're trying to match things. And how can you do this quickly? 
in particular, this client was quite interested in doing this in a way that could save them money. And they were really interested in seeing how, how far can we get, let's say, on a single node or even on AWS Lambda. And we found that actually we could do the entire thing on AWS Lambda. Mm. AWS Lambda is a very constrained computing environment. There you've got maximum 15 minutes to complete a job. You've got maximum 250 megabytes for your package size. So that means that installing, let's say, um, like the newest versions of Pandas, PyArrow and NumPy all together, it just wouldn't fit. Hmm. However, we found, well, Polos is fairly lightweight. We didn't need PyArrow, Pandas or NumPy for this task. We can make it work. So on the packaging side, we also needed some Rust extensions. And I think that's not super easy to get into AWS Lambda, but here, this allows me to talk about one of Polar's superpowers, and that is that you can extend it. You can make Polar's plugins. You can write your own Rust extensions for Polar's, which you can then distribute onto PyPI, and people can just pip install them as they would any other Python package. Mm. And then it just fits in naturally with the rest of your Polar's workflow as if it was part of Polar's itself. So for this client, we wrote one new Polar's plugin for this task. We leveraged a couple of Polos plugins, which the community had already built, which happened to perfectly suit our use case. And like this, Polos, I think we were using three Polos plugins, then the, like Boto3, S3FS, some other packages which are just used in AWS for cloud computing. And we could fit all of this easily within the limit. Now comes the data constraints, because there in AWS Lambda, I think you've got a limit of like 10 gigabytes of RAM, but we needed to query hundreds of gigabytes of data. And this is where lazy execution really helps. In particular, lazy execution with Polos plugins. So we could say, scan all of this data and then use the plugins to determine which rows need reading and only read those. So then Polos knows which parts of the data set, it, of, of all of these hundreds of gigabytes it needs to read based on Rust extensions, which mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. customized things which were written. And in the end, it, it could all fit within the memory and time constraints. I think this could be possible using other technologies, but I am pretty confident that it would not have been so easy. Polos really made it easy for us. If you're a regular listener, you know that last year I did a European podcast tour interviewing incredible guests in Amsterdam, Paris, and Berlin. While all the guests spoke perfect English, Babbel was invaluable for me to learn and practice Dutch, French, and German, enabling me to get directions and order my meals in the local language. Super fun, rewarding, and in some cases, an essential skill. Now you can do the same with a special limited time deal. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash superdata. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash superdata, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash superdata. Rules and restrictions may apply. That's a very cool case study to kind of uh, re to uh, summarize back some of the key points from that. Um, you talked about, you mentioned actually already earlier in the episode how one of the advantages of Polars is that it can be extended with Rust. But now yeah. we got a sense of what that really means. And so these Rust extensions become add-ons that you can very easily install just for the PyPy call, um, just like you know if you were bringing in Pandas or Polars. Um, and so very, very easy to do that. And those Rust add-ons they can be customized for tasks like going over hundreds of gigabytes of data, identifying relevant rows, um, and then allowing you, therefore, to have even running in that highly constrained AWS Lambda environment, which is a small amount of code you're able to execute highly efficiently. Uh, it's a really cool case study. Did I, did, I, did I kind of get that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I like the summarizing. Listen to the last episode on super communicators for more on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah, that yeah. was uh, the, uh, the, the preceding episode before I was recording with Marco today was episode number 805 with Charles Duhigg. So Charles Duhigg is a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, journalist. He's a many time best-selling authors. 
Oh, a many time best selling author. He's not multiple authors. <laughs> not that I'm aware of. I don't think he has a secret pseudonym. Um, but his most recent book is called Super Communicators. And we talked about it a fair bit in that episode, 805. And it's interesting because I don't usually have mainstream authors on the show. Usually, even, you know, we have sometimes like data storytelling experts, like Cole Newsbomber, Knaflik. But those are people who, even though her data sto- storytelling book was a huge bestseller, she comes from kind of like a technical data science background. Charles wasn't like that, um, but I, he was just such a big mainstream author <laughs> that when he approached me on the show, I was like, sure, let's do it. Because who can't benefit from knowing more about communication? Yeah, exactly. It was a great episode. I'm sure lots of people enjoyed it. Yeah. On the Rust yeah. extensions, though, yeah, something yeah, yeah. I'd like to clarify is that it's not as scary as it sounds. I'm sure if we could see people's faces from the audience, <laughs> we'd be seeing some blank stares. When I've talked about Polos plugins at uh, conferences, that's often what happens. Like people think, uh, who is this guy and why is he expecting us to write Rust extensions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my claim is it's not that difficult to make a Polos plugin. Like Polos has some really complicated Rust code inside it, but it's the, the Polos plugins mechanism is that complexity is abstracted away enough that if you can express your business logic in uh, Python, it's not that much of a stretch if you just know the basics of Rust to translate that into a Polos plugin. I've got a Polos plugins tutorial online. If you just search uh, Marco Gorelli Polos plugins, I'd like to think you can find it. Freely available resource. And it can teach you how you, coming from a Python background, can learn just enough Rust uh, to, to write your Polos plugins. It covers yeah, how to distribute them, different data types, uh, some performance tips. I'm sure we'll include that in the show notes. I'm sure, sure we'll, uh, we have, I, you know, I don't talk about her enough on air, but she also deserves praise. Uh, you know, I, I frequently actually come on and talk about our researcher, Serge Massis, who, like you're already experiencing, Marco, today, has done incredible research, digging out lots of great topic areas and specific technical questions, which is super helpful. But someone else that is invaluable on the show is our podcast manager, Ivana, who uh, goes through, and anytime we mention uh, things like this, you know, the guest mentioned some some uh, blog post of theirs or some tutorial like you just mentioned that they can download, and she goes and makes sure that it's there for you in the show notes, keeping everything organized and on time, and that's how we get 104 episodes a year, all released on time for many, many years in a row, thanks to her. So anyway. Cool. Nice one, Ivana. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so back to the amazing uh, Surge uh, topic flow and the kinds of questions that he has covered. Um, you mentioned geocoding in your last example, and we didn't actually even really get back to how that was, you know, after you've kind of gone through the performance optimizations, what was the kind of net effect for the geocoding? Maybe we should, we should draw a line out of that quickly. Yeah, sure. The net effect was that the client was able to go from having to make expensive API calls, from having to run something on, on, a, on a cluster with multiple nodes, to just being able to run something in the most constrained possible uh, computing environment. So for them, it was a saving in terms of time, in terms of compute resources, in terms of maintainability. They were really happy with the solution. Very cool. And so when I think about geocoding, <laughs> it seems vaguely related. Uh, you know, you maybe like me uh, travel around the world a lot. And so this kind of idea of moving around, uh, something that moves around as we move around is the time zones. And that's a huge pain, not only for our body clocks, but also for anybody who's developing software and having to manage over many time zones. So you've cautioned previously against manually managing time zones. So you did this in a conference talk. Um, could you elaborate on the challenges that you faced when trying to uh, manually handle time zones and why software like Polar's is a more reliable solution? Sure. I, yeah, I remember having a, seeing a colleague trying to manually put in a if-then statement to deal with daylight savings time. Yeah, that's a bad idea. <laughs> Chances are you won't be able to get it right. You won't get the direction right. 
If you then need to communicate with people in different countries, like in the US, they observe daylight savings time at a different uh, time than we Relative do in the UK. UK. And yeah, there's even, exactly. I think Arizona doesn't observe daylight savings time at all. Oh, great. Yeah. Lots of countries don't observe <laughs> it at all. I think in Morocco they do, but they go in the opposite direction. It's uh, t- Time zones are a mess. And then you find that countries have changed uh, time zone offsets, um, you know, like maybe like in the UK, we are like a plus zero most of the year, sometimes plus one. Uh, some countries, like uh, at some point in time, they decided, yeah, we're going to go from like uh, minus 13 to plus 11. That's it. And you, you, you might think that it's manageable to do this by hand, but it's really not. You want to leverage a third party library to do this. So Polos has full support for time zones in the sense that any operation which is uh, time aware, you can do it respecting time zones. My advice with time zones is you should avoid them if you can. They're an absolute mess, and they also come with a bit of a performance hit. It's just a a necessity. Uh, Unfortunately, you can't necessarily avoid time zones if your boss is asking you for like uh, (laughs) daily sales or something, and your company is selling at every hour of the day, then you better do it in a time zone aware manner. If you take the trick which some people suggest of like convert to UTC, do your analysis and then convert convert back, then you're going to miss subtleties due to daylight savings time and other things. So just convert to UTC and back might be a solution in some cases, but definitely not in all cases, which is why it's important for software like Polars to have good support for time zones. Personally, one benefit that I got from getting involved in time zones is that it led me to get involved in Polars. So Side note, open source tip. Sometimes people ask, how do you get involved in open source? How do you start contributing to something like Polars that looks so complicated? And uh, my advice is, if you've got some topic that's valuable and that's interesting to you, but is boring to other people, then that's your competitive advantage. When I started contributing to Polars, I noticed that a lot of the time zone stuff just hadn't been done. The other maintainers just didn't find it very interesting or found it frustrating and all of that. And I was like, okay, well, I don't know Rust. Maybe this can be a bit of a win-win situation. Like, I'll help you with your time zones. You help me with my Rust. And yeah, it worked. Just started fixing stuff up, learned a lot about Rust in the meantime, and uh, got totally addicted to the process. So I, I need to pair that word of caution with my open source tip. Like, if you... You, you might get started with something, you might find that people are appreciating what you do, but it's very difficult to then not get addicted to it. And, um, <laughs> I call it a, a legalized drug, just something to keep in mind. And a lot of people who then do a lot of open source, they end up doing a lot of it in their spare time, and it's not so easy to draw a balance. I can't offer very good advice when it comes to drawing a balance between uh, life and open source, because I'm not there yet, mm-hmm. but working on it. Yeah, I understand what that can be like. Um, it's it's definitely not the same thing. And I, I so I have not done much open source contributing at all. And it's been many years since I've done any. I mean, I've I've I open source Python scripts in Jupyter notebooks when I do tutorials. So for YouTube videos that I make on uh, you know machine learning foundations or uh, introductory you know deep learning tutorials, I do open source my code. And sometimes people you know, make uh, issues and then I resolve them or uh, there's some small amount of collaboration. But that doesn't really feel to me like the kind of open source collaboration that you're describing. You know, if you're working on Rust <laughs> or Polars and, uh, you know, you're, it's this big ecosystem with, I imagine, hundreds of contributors and everybody has their own little piece and everything needs to work together and execute properly. And so, you know, I haven't done that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, to a significant extent. Yeah, I mean, that, that is kind of really enabled by all of the modern tools we have, like uh, GitHub, all of the CI minutes uh, that uh, GitHub gives us. Uh, otherwise, it would be so difficult to coordinate between hundreds of contributors. What I find the hardest is the people part, like API decisions. This part is really difficult. Something I noticed recently in Pandas is there's a function which does not behave as its doc string says it does. Mm. And it's been like that since at least 2019. And now, what do we do? Like, do we correct it, but then it's going to break people's code who were relying on it? Mm-hmm. Do we 
update the doc string, but then the behavior that it does ha have seems rather odd. It's just so difficult to make that kind of decision. Whatever you do, you're going to anger some people. Yeah, that's the hardest part of open source. In the end, uh, technical issues are <laughs> yeah. relatively easy compared to some of the people ones. Yeah, version issues are a pain for sure. Um, so anyway, we kind of digressed uh, over here from, we were talking about time zones and uh, you got talking about how your interest in time zones, it was a stepping stone for you to learn about Rust, but also to contribute to the Polar's time zone functionality. And so it was a win-win. And then since then you've been addicted to open source <laughs> contribution. Something like that, yeah. Um, so what is it about the way that Polars handles time zones now that you've been working on it that is like, how does that look and feel for me differently um, you know, as, as a Polars user? Uh, compared to before I started contributing. Yeah, yeah or compared to sure. know, other alternatives out there. Well, yeah, compared to other alternatives, that, other, compared to other alternatives that work, I'd like to think you shouldn't notice much of a difference. Compared mm. to before I started contributing, the difference is that the time zone is typically taken into account when you're doing calculations. So I remember some of the early bugs that I would see was something like, uh, if I try to do, calculate the daily average, then uh, the daily average is done on the UTC time mm. rather than on the local time. It's like, okay, yeah, we need to fix that. And then it's like, oh, but if I uh, pass this data, then um, it just errors because of an ambiguous date time. There should be a way to resolve that ambiguous date times. You know, so when we do daylight savings, we shift the clock back uh, at one point of the year, and we shift the clock forwards at another part of the year. So when we turn the clock back, then we're essentially repeating the same times multiple, ti multiple uh, times. Yeah. So I'm using the word times uh, but no, to mean different funny. things. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, exactly. Like when, <laughs> when, the, when the clock goes backward, for example, yeah, yeah. you end up having... I think I think it switches at two a.m. or yeah, exactly. So like two thirty or something, it's going to happen twice. Twice in one night. Yeah. And uh, if you're trying to pass a string which contains uh, two thirty on the twenty fifth of October, twenty twenty, how do you know which two thirty it refers to? Mm -hmm. it must be an absolute nightmare being a policeman and having to go through reports <laughs> where people are trying to reconstruct what happened. Anyway, if you're doing this in Polis, there needs to be a way to deal with that. So I introduced an ambiguous argument to the to date time function similar to, like, to what, what there is in pandas. And it at least gives you a way to deal with it. In a recent episode of this podcast, the mathematical optimization guru, Jerry Yurchison, joined us to detail how you can leverage mathematical optimization to drive commercial decision-making, giving you the confidence to deliver provably optimal decisions. This is where Grobi optimization comes into play. Trusted by most of the world's leading enterprises, Grobi's cutting-edge optimization solver, lightweight APIs, and flexible deployment simplify the data-to-decision journey. And thankfully, if you're new to mathematical optimization approaches, Grobi offers a wealth of resources for data scientists, including hands-on training, comprehensive Jupyter Notebook examples, and extensive free online courses. Check out episode number 813 of this podcast to learn more about mathematical optimization and all of these great resources from Grobi. That's episode number 813. Very cool. Um, so polars might be something that people have heard about for the first time from this episode. Um, while, you know, even in my introduction to polars, I assumed that pretty much anyone who's a hands-on data scientist knows pandas, has very likely even used pandas. Um, so with this rapid development of polars, where do you see it heading? It's blossoming in popularity. I hear people talking about it more and more. I think that's a big part of why. I was like, we've got to get Marco on and have a Polar's episode because we haven't talked about that yet. And I feel like it's something everyone needs to know about. So where do you think Polar's is heading? Um, yeah, like where do, where do you think it's next, you know, it's going next in its evolution? I don't know if I've kind of teed you up enough with this question. You might already have some thoughts on how to answer. Sure. So I think there's two parts of Polar's we need to talk about. One is the implementation itself, and the other is the API. And in the, the implementation follows its own API, of course, but the API can take on a bit of a life of its own, just like the Pandas API took on a bit of a life of its own. So Pandas follows the Pandas API, but then we saw Modin come along, which also follows the Pandas API, 
and then uh, FireDux and uh, QDF. And now we're seeing that Polos might be going in a similar direction. Modin is a data frame library which historically has promised to uh, distribute your Pandas code. And now they're also offering a Polos API. Now they haven't released details of what's going on under the hood with regards to the engine, but the fact that, the, that Polos has become popular enough that they are like, okay, we need to do something with this. <laughs> it's a good sign. Uh, we're seeing that NVIDIA are contributing GPU support to Polos. So earlier you were talking about how when you've got lazy execution, at some point you want to actually see the results. You need to tell Polos that you want to see the results. What uh, the team is working towards is the ability that when you tell Polos you want to see the results, you can tell it, compute this for me, but do it on GPU. So then you're making use of both GPU acceleration and query optimization. I don't think the world is ready for such levels of speed. <laughs> So in terms of where are, we, where are we going, I think that the library itself is going to grow, but I think the Polos API, I'd like to see it become a bit of a data frame standard. I'd like to think that when people make new data frame libraries, and there will be new data frame libraries, I don't think Polos is the last one, I'd like to think that their API will be much more similar to the Polos one than to the, the, the Pandas one, which has dominated the data frame API space in Python up until very recently. Very cool. Um, it's nice to hear your insights into what's happening next and these kinds of, uh, these interplay between different libraries uh, and technologies facilitated by, say, with uh, Modin, you know, facilitating broader distribution, with NVIDIA supporting execution on GPUs. Um, something that must be very near and dear to your heart, or at least to your addiction, is um, another, uh, another open source project that you created that allows for um, compatibility. <laughs> and so this is Narwhals. So um, uh, last year, uh, you described Narwhals as an extremely lightweight compatibility layer between pandas and polars. So what is the problem that you're addressing there with your, narwhal, with your Narwhals library? Sure, thanks for asking about it. It still uh, slightly cracks me up that we've got a library called Narwhals that we're actually talking about. It uh, started off as a little weekend project and I was feeling a bit silly, so I called it after a viral Mr. Weeble song, but now it's <laughs> being adopted by some people, so I guess we're stuck with the name. Uh, maybe before I go in too deep, just a slight correction. I think this mm. year I described it like that. I only oh. released it back in February. It's a very young project, but it's quickly yeah, gaining a bit I'm of traction. Yeah, I'm sure you're right. That must be a, a rare research error. <laughs> oh, maybe not a research error, maybe confusion with another similar project. Uh, before Narwhals, I was involved in a group called the Data Frame Consortium, which was trying to make a data frame standard, like some data frame API that different data frame libraries could implement, and then people could write data frame agnostic code on top of. It's difficult to get different people to agree, and the stakes here were pretty high, and I just wasn't able to agree with most people there. I found myself disagreeing with most of the participants about nearly everything. I wanted to bring things decidedly towards Polars. They wanted things to be not exactly like Pandas, but they didn't want things to deviate too much from Pandas. Mm -hmm. They didn't want things to deviate too much from what most people were familiar with, and from what would be difficult for them to implement. So in the end, after having agreed to disagree, I said, well, let's take all of these ideas which the consortium had rejected and let's package them as its own thing. Let's call it Narwhals and let's see what happens. And the idea is, it's, uh, it's like what the data frame standard was trying to be. So just some API which different backends can implement and which a library can then use to just define its transformations, to just define its data frame logic and then the user can bring their own data frame, pass their own data frame in, and they can just use it seamlessly as if that library was written specifically for their data frame. So if someone comes along with pandas, they can just use it. Someone else comes along with polars, they can just use it. The pandas user doesn't need to have polars installed, and the polars user doesn't need to have pandas installed. This is what we're aiming to enable. What kind of surprised me was that interest in it happened a lot faster than I was thinking. 
So within about a month or two, we had a Scikit Lego, which is like a medium-sized library for some extra things which don't quite fit into Scikit Learn. And yeah, they decided to adopt it, which aside from the fact that it's kind of nice as a Polos user to be able to use a library without having to convert to pandas. It also made a massive performance uh, difference in, in some cases. So Polos, because of the reasons we described at the beginning of the episode, it really excels at feature engineering. It can do things in parallel, it can do common subplan elimination. And so for the feature engineering functions in Scikit-Lego, doing it directly in Polos, as opposed to having to convert to pandas, doing the operation in pandas, and then converting back to Polos, it can make I had one benchmark where I was seeing even a close to 150x uh, speedup, which was really quite uh, massive. So yeah, I was pretty happy with that. And then what made me fall off my seat just a couple of weeks ago was the major visualization library Altair have adopted novels. And so like this, they've made NumPy optional, Pandas optional, PyArrow optional. Uh, I think PyArrow might have been optional from the start, but if you were trying to plot a Polos library, you were required to have PyArrow installed. Whereas now, you can just pass a Polos data frame to Altair, you don't need NumPy, don't need Pandas, don't need PyArrow, and it'll just plot it natively. So for Polos users, they just need this very lightweight library, and they can make beautiful, possibly interactive plots. And this is exactly what I was hoping to enable with Narwhals, just a better adoption for Polos and other newer data frame libraries at no cost to their existing Pandas users. Very cool. Let's talk about actually Altair for a second here. All right. Because that is a library. So uh, it's a Python library? It's a Python library, yes. And so uh, I'm used to thinking about really the only two, well, OK, maybe I can think of three plotting libraries off the top of my head. Obviously, Matplotlib. Um, Seaborn, which has been popular for years, is a more is a slightly prettier, um, like his Matplotlib is like it's just it, all with all of the um, kind of base. Um, if you just stick with all of the um, with a, with a, with a basic pre-installed configurations, you end up with pretty unattractive plots with quite like abrupt colors um, next to each other. Whereas Seaborn, out of the box, creates beautiful plots. Um, the other library I could think of off the top of my head for plotting is Plotly. Um, and I actually can't off the top of my head remember why I would use Plotly. Uh, Plotly is nice, yeah. It makes really nice interactive plots for you pretty much out of the interactive box. Interactive plots. Yeah, yeah. Right, really yeah. recommend that one. Yeah, Seaborn is nice as well. Yeah, it's, as you say, it's like a wrapper around Matplotlib. Like with Matplotlib, you can do anything. I think practically literally anything. Like things you just didn't even know were possible. You'll find some answer on Stack Overflow where someone has given you an answer, but uh, yeah, not super easy friendly. And uh, Seaborn makes it a lot easier. Um, my hope is that maybe if Narwhals can become more popular, maybe Seaborn can trust us enough that uh, we can rewrite Seaborn to be Narwhalified and people can pass Polos data frames into Seaborn. Not currently possible, but hey, let's see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very cool. And uh, I've said very cool way too much in this episode, but <laughs> I, th I thought that a lot of the things that you said are very cool. And then hopefully my transitions have become a little bit more nuanced after I say that phrase. But um, uh, with Altair specifically, this is a library that I've only just started to hear people talking about, but it's, it is widely used. Yeah, yeah. And so why would somebody, why should a listener think about picking up Altair and, and using that library for plotting interactively? I think the API is really nice and consistent, and you can um, it, it it kind of just makes sense in your head. At least the way that I would think about making plots. They've got a nice grammar. It there is a bit of a learning curve. You need to learn these rules. You need to learn about uh, channels and marks. But once you get it, you can you can make plots and you can make them look nice and you can make uh, you can plot what you want. I think it might not be quite as highly customizable as something like Matplotlib. So if you need to make really super highly customized plots, then maybe it's not uh, the perfect solution. But I think for most data scientists who need to tell stories with their uh, plots, who need to understand data, 
I think it's a really good solution. This Norwell's project, which you only started on a year ago, it sounds like it's... <laughs> February. You only less started than, in less February. Less than a year. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> um, it already has been picked up by places like Altair. It's already making a big impact. Um, it, part of what's so impressive about it is its minimal overhead and its lack of dependencies in its design. Um, so how hard or easy was it to get that level of efficiency? Were there some big technical challenges that you faced while developing? Sure, so on the dependency side, I don't think it's that difficult. I think it's just a matter of willpower. So if you want to keep your library dependency free, I think it's usually not that much of a stretch. In this case, suppose that you're a library which receives a data frame from the user and you want to know whether it's a pandas data frame. Like the obvious solution is to try importing pandas and if that succeeds, you check if it's a pandas data frame. But we can actually do better than that. Because if somebody has passed as a pandas data frame, it means that they must have already imported pandas. So we can just do import sys. We can check all of the libraries that the user has already imported in sys.modules and see if pandas is in there. And if it's not, then obviously this cannot be a pandas data frame. So we don't even need to try importing pandas. So what we're very strict about in Narwhals is we don't import anything. Like this, we don't risk introducing dependencies mm. and uh, we don't risk uh, slowing things down by forcing people to import things which uh, the object uh, just isn't. So that's uh, part of it. The other part of it is the overhead. That, I think, isn't so immediate we, because we're translating syntax. The, the key there is to just have a good mental model of what Polar's expressions are. And uh, to me, an expression is just a function from a data frame to a sequence of series. Once you define it that way, then uh, chaining expressions together, chaining these calls. It's just a matter of uh, chaining lambda functions one after the other. You can just, uh, you just need to be very rigorous about recursively applying this definition everywhere. And it all just kind of happens. There is potential for overhead in the sense that pandas does, uh, does a lot of things with the index, which you don't necessarily want. Pandas is always aligning indices with each other, but Polos doesn't have a notion of an index. So if you want to make Pandas behavior mirror the Polos one with the same API, you need to be careful to avoid automated index realignment. The naive solution to that would be to do re in, uh, reset index all the time, which is in fact what we see in a lot of users' code. Reset index is not a free operation though. So what we do in novels is that the, the API itself means that when you're comparing columns, they typically are derived from the same data frame just because of how the expressions API works. So we just do a quick check of whether the, the, the index of the left-hand side is the same as the index of the right-hand side. Like we don't even compare the values. We just check left index is right index. If it is, then we leave it alone. And if it's not, we set the right-hand side's index to be the left-hand side's index. And what I've observed empirically then is that compared to the naive way of writing pandas code, we can often make things a little bit faster, which, uh, although I need to caveat that. So in pandas version three, copy on write will become the default. This is an optimization. So once that becomes the default, then uh, writing via novels or writing pandas code directly shouldn't make a difference. Uh, before, before that, I've noticed that novels will often make things a bit faster, unless you're dealing with like a 100 row data frame. In, if you've got something so small, then the overhead of uh, just the extra Python calls within novels is not, uh, it, it is going to be detectable. You're going to have an extra half a millisecond there. So if you need to write a reactive web application using uh, data frames, uh, yeah, maybe just use the data frame library directly. Don't use novels for anything more than 100 rows, for anything where half a millisecond of overhead is tolerable, then I think it, I'd like to think it's a good solution. And for Polos users especially, that half a millisecond of overhead compared to the overhead of converting to pandas, it's nothing. Very cool, great summary point there. Very cool again, <laughs> you're getting from me. Um, you have expressed hope for a future where data science becomes data frame agnostic. So could you explain for us what data frame agnosticism is? Sure, yeah. Well, 
you very kindly introduced the topic earlier by bringing up Seaborn. Seaborn just uh, takes the data frame and then visualizes it. Like there's nothing about the library that, about the logic of the library that should be tied to pandas. So why is it that it only works on pandas? Like it does accept other data frame libraries, but the, if it receives anything else, the first thing it does is it converts it to pandas and then it does everything else. And there's no theoretical reason why that should be the case. Like, uh, I don't know, what, what does Seaborn do inside? It takes a column, it uh, does a group by, and it finds the sum. Like, I think every data frame library does that. Certainly every data frame library that we're supporting in novels. So I'd like to think that we can aim for a future where libraries such as Seaborn can just define their logic, and then the library can be data frame agnostic. So long as you're either supported by Narwhals or you, com you comply with the Narwhals API, then your library can just slot in there. And the good thing about standards is that they really enable freedom. Because as much as I love open source, I'm not an open source absolutist. <laughs> and the nice thing about having a standard out there, about having like a, a Narwhals specification and its API, is that someone can come along with their closed source solution and we don't need to know about it. Like, as long as their closed source uh, solution respects the Narwhal's API, then it'll work seamlessly without them having to ask us for permission to do anything, without them having to open source their library. I prefer it if people open source things, but as I said, I'm not an open source absolutist. And I think uh, this is one thing that uh, a standard specification like the Narwhal's one can uh, enable. That was a, a great summary to kind of uh, give us a sense of why the Narwhals project is so important and this idea of a data frame agnostic future. And I could imagine that not even just with data frames, there's probably lots of ways that in development in general, we could have more interoperability between libraries by thinking about commonalities and not having you know, discrete silos of specific projects that are you know, segregated from each other. That's the thing, yeah. It's not just... Uh... The, the silos thing, that's an important thing. Lots of projects, they just develop their things. Like in writing novels, in interacting with people from lots of different projects, it's a lot of fun. It's just a lot of fun to collaborate with uh, communities from different projects. And that was, yeah, just an unexpectedly positive benefit of this project and probably the part that I'm enjoying the most. Nice. So we've heard now a lot about specific open source projects. I've alluded to how... Quantsite Labs, where you work, has a hybrid employment model, which balances time between community projects like open source development and consulting work, which brings in revenue directly. Um, so how does this model, where you're splitting time between open source and consulting work, benefit both uh, the maintainers like yourself, as well as commercial clients of Quantsite Labs? Sure. So, well, you asked how it benefits maintainers first, so let's start with that. <laughs> we often get started with open source because we're excited about fixing things, we're excited about adding new features that we might want. But then uh, what happens uh, five years down the line to those features which you've added? Uh, like, uh, someone's going to have to keep them uh, working. And the reality of open source is that most people make one or two contributions somewhere and then vanish. When it comes to yeah, sustaining things for a long time, it's fairly difficult to do this just on willpower, just, on, just with the volunteer work alone. A lot of these open source projects have become so big, so widely used, they've practically become critical infrastructure. And it's just not feasible for everything to be done by, by volunteers. So fortunately, we've been seeing funding come in for open source projects. We've been seeing a CZI, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Uh, we've been seeing uh, NASA d donate money to open source uh, projects and uh, l lots of other companies. Uh, it's nice to see that the Python Software Foundation itself has been able to hire, I think, even two people to work on uh, Python development as opposed to just being volunteers. So in terms of how it helps maintainers to receive some money, it means that for a lot of the tasks which you just would not be able to do as a volunteer, you can do them. Some uh, big picture things, like um, totally reworking how something uh, functions in Pandas. As a volunteer, if you've just got a couple of hours each Sunday to do that, you're not going to have a chance to do that. 
you can maybe work on some incremental improvements, but you can't like rework how something uh, functions. But if you've got some funding behind it, it can work. When it comes to reviewing other pull people's pull requests, if you've got time, uh, if you're paid to do that, uh, you can do it. People are often much more motivated to work on their own things than to review other people's. The other side, though, is that, uh, yeah, Quantsite Labs is not a charity. Um, they don't just, out of the goodness of their heart, uh, give maintainers time uh, to do things. It also helps the bottom line, because there are companies that then know Quantsite as experts in open source. So with open source maintenance, this also benefits Quantsight itself. Companies are coming in for training, for help with how to use software, but also sometimes with very bespoke uh, features. So they maybe want, uh, they're like, oh, you know, I really want uh, Pandas to support uh, non-nanosecond resolution. Uh, can someone please do this for me? And that was an actual request we got uh, once. And it's not something that was uh, completely delivered by Quantsight, but uh, Quantsight really enabled it. Like, if Quantsight had not been part of the picture, I question whether that would have happened at all. Maybe it would have taken an extra three years for, for it to happen. Uh, so, yeah, it's nice that at Quantsight, then we've got people involved in sales, in marketing, who know how money works, as opposed to just being people coding in their spare time who don't necessarily have the skills or knowledge to, to deal with that. Makes perfect sense. And long may commercial supporters of open source work continue. I'm a huge fan of open source work. Most of the libraries, if not 100% of the libraries that I've been programming with for more than a decade now. There was a time when I was using MATLAB. <laughs> I remember that, yeah. <laughs> but don't have, and yeah, I don't think I've written a line of MATLAB code in over a decade. And since then, it's been all open source programming for me all of the time. All of the training that I do is in open source. Um, a huge amount of the code that we use at my software company, Nebula, for developing our data science models for our whole back end, front end of the platform. Everything is open source. And so hugely grateful. You know, you mentioned the Chan Zuckerberg initiative. Meta also obviously has been pouring huge amounts of capital into training and open sourcing large language models, like their Llama series of models. And yeah, all of these things make a big difference. They allow all of us as data science lovers, listeners to this podcast, to be able to do more and yeah, make a big impact. So yeah, I hope that this trend continues. It's great to kind of hear behind the scenes how things work uh, with Quantside Labs in particular, and maybe that in will inspire some <laughs> consultancy owners out there who are listening or other people to be thinking about how you can be uh, supporting open source workers or open source projects in order to help your bottom line while also doing a service to the whole world. Now, a a question here that our researcher Serge dug up is that um, according to a source that he found, only about three to 5% of open source contributors are women, which is a really low percentage. Uh, you know, the, the, I don't know the exact percentage off the top of my head, but I know that the percentage of women, say working in data, scientists, or in data science and in software development is much higher than three to 5%. And so, um, do you have any thoughts on proactive steps that people could take so that uh, open source projects like Pandas, like Polars, like Narwhals, um, uh, you know, have more diversity uh, than, than today? Yeah, totally. Really important topic to talk about because you're, you're right about these percentages not being aligned. Like sometimes people may people explain it away by saying, oh yeah, but it's a pipeline problem. There's uh, fewer women in tech, so obviously there's going to be fewer women contributing to open source. But then the percentage who do contribute is a lot lower than the percentage who are in tech. And there's a variety of reasons uh, for that. I mean, I think we can't discount the fact that women do most of the unpaid labor in society. And uh, if open source is a primarily ledger activity, 
then uh, it means they've got less uh, mm. time for it. Mm -hmm. It's not the only reason, though. I think things are getting better, but there's a lot of projects where it does it does feel that uh, a bit like uh, an old boys club, like in like the way maybe that people use uh, humor, the kinds of things that people might uh, say or discuss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that have historically been uh, tolerated that probably right. shouldn't have. Locker room talk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, now it's quite rare to find a, a, a project that doesn't have a code of conduct. But we should remember that it was not always the case. Like, it wasn't that long ago that just bringing up the question, uh, should a project have a code of conduct, would spark a whole load of controversy with people saying, oh, but it's not really necessary. Like, uh, we haven't had any harassment uh, yet. Why do we need this? And, well, okay, just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean it's not happening. Right. You did ask a specific question, though, which is what can we do about it? That's a tough one. So first I'd like to slightly defer to Dr. Maren Westerman's talk at Eurosci last year, in which she really talks about the importance of mentoring. Because it's not just about getting people to try contributing. It's about sustaining people. I was involved for a while, like with Pie Ladies London, trying to do some panda sprints, trying to get uh, people from underrepresented groups in tech to contribute. And these sessions were fairly well attended and people made contributions. We got a lot of people involved, but it's very difficult then to sustain people. It requires an active effort. You, I think, unless you're actively going to set aside time and money towards mentoring people, it's very difficult. And this becomes doubly difficult in a project which has already been going on for like 15 years or something, and which has historically been all male. Like at that point, to rectify that, you're going to have to put in twice as much effort as if you were just starting from scratch. Now, in Pandas, I don't think we've got much uh, hope of making a significant difference there, to be honest. I mean, we do now have one uh, woman core developer, uh, but realistically, um, it's the percentage of women is... I think it's unlikely to get close to the percentage of women in tech. Um, at least without active efforts. And yeah, active efforts take time, take money. Yeah. Unfortunately, Pandas didn't even receive CZI funding this year, so it's going to be tricky. With Narwhals, starting from the beginning, we've been a, a lot more careful about this. Like, I was messaging talented women that I knew saying, hey, maybe this, maybe... Are you interested in trying out this project? I can help you out, provide quick reviews. And yeah, we've got lots of women who are contributing, who have given uh, commit rights to, uh, going to do, probably going to take part in the Grace Hopper conference later this year, which is, uh, I think it's primarily aimed at women. So yeah, with novels from the start, we're just making this a priority. And maybe we'll be able to do things differently. I don't know, we'll see. Nice. That sounds like a step in the right direction to me. It also sounded like you had some uh, great tips in there for projects in general. So more mentorship would make a big difference. Um, your technique has been, you know, active reach outs to maybe because that kind of thing happens where if somebody like you who you know created this project taps you on the shoulder and says, "Hey, you know, you have the skills I need. Would you like to be involved?" that can flip things in someone's mind right away from thinking, oh, you know, this isn't something that's for me, um, you know, because maybe I haven't seen people like me do this before or, you know, just didn't imagine that, that I could. But then someone taps you on the shoulder and you're like, okay, yeah, maybe I, I, I can do this. I can give it a shot. Especially if I guess if, if some mentorship is paired in there. And then you made an interesting point there near the beginning of your answer around more paid roles. So if, so you didn't say this explicitly, but you said that, uh, because in, in a lot of, in, in maybe all, um, cultures around the world, uh, women disproportionately do unpaid work, uh, you know, in, in the household, in child rearing, these kinds of things. Um, you know, there, there are exceptions on an individual basis, but on a society as a whole, this is what we see. And so there's maybe something, some like big problem of society that, could be rectified over long periods of time, 
But in the immediate term, um, having more and more paid open source developer work, uh, roles would alleviate some of this problem because then uh, you know, somebody doesn't have to be you know, thinking about having this additional unpaid work on top of the paid work that they already do because they can incorporate it into their paid role. Totally, yeah. It needs to be an active effort. Like it's not gonna fix itself. Yeah. Great answer. I've got one last topic area for you. We've heard a lot in this episode about the brilliant software development that you've done on a data library on Polars and also Narwhals uh, supporting Polars. But you have done some data science work in the past, specifically around forecasting. Um, so you achieved impressive results in several forecasting competitions, such as the M5 and M6 forecasting challenges. Do you want to tell us about what those challenges are? Sure, let's see if I can remember. <laughs> that was a few years ago. Uh, yeah, I used to work in data science. So, well, my background's in mathematics, but then uh, realized I wasn't uh, good enough to be a mathematics academic, so became a data scientist. And, uh, <laughs> Zing. <laughs> then got uh, addicted to open source and became a software engineer. But yeah, for uh, four or five years or something like that, I did work in data science and got quite interested in uh, forecasting because it was quite related to work I was doing in companies. And I just found that taking part in competitions was a fun way to uh, improve your skills. People sometimes say that these competitions are not real data science. And I agree, it's not real data science in that it doesn't show you the complete life cycle of a data science project. But it can teach you some real lessons, which can then be useful when you are doing real data science. <laughs> so the M5 competition, that was a fun one. There you had to forecast Walmart sales. It was, yeah, real data. And there were two tracks to it, the uncertainty one and the point prediction one. I worked with a friend of mine on the, on the yeah, on both of them. We were, um, yeah, just as people often did in, on Kaggle back then, like blending solutions together. And what we generally found, what generally the Kaggle community finds is uh, the most important thing isn't like uh, using the most unusual model, but having a good way of cross-validating your data, of like having a way of estimating how well is your model going to perform on unseen data. And... When people talk about uh, Kaggle and real life data science, I think the, the fact that it teaches you to do cross-validation well is the biggest benefit that it will bring you. Uh, then came the M6 competition, and that was financial forecasting. And there I just took a bit of a gamble. I just figured, well, most people are going to overfit. And <laughs> if, I, I don't know anything about finance. If I just submit the simplest possible thing, then maybe it'll land in the top 10% and I can put that on my CV. Um, <laughs> unexpectedly, I came a second in the first quarter and was awarded $6,000 for that. So, yeah, I put that on my, on my CV to look smart, but uh, I, I don't know anything about finance. Like, I, I don't have any insight here. Like if someone wants to come to me for trading advice, then uh, I, I can't tell you anything useful other than uh, don't do anything wild. <laughs> I can tell you about how to beat other competitors in financial forecasting competitions, but not necessarily how to do. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, so two tips there. So you might be able to outcompete people in forecasting competitions by sticking to simpler models um, that are less likely to overfitting. And also the importance of cross-validation, which you mentioned there, which is something, uh, if you're not already aware of it, this is where you take, say, um, a common way of describing cross-validation is with k-fold cross-validation, so where you split your data into some number of partitions. And so if you did, say, five-fold uh, cross-validation, you would train your model on, uh, well, you split your data into five parts of equal size randomly, uh, putting samples into each of those five buckets, uh, equally sized, and you train on 40%. So when you train on four of the buckets, evaluate on the fifth, and then you can repeat that five times, each time leaving a different 
20%, so the first 20%, the second 20%, third 20%, going like that through all five 20%. Um, and in this way, you are uh, training and validating on all of your data, taking advantage of all of it. Yeah, maybe just a small note in time series, you need to be especially careful with how you make your buckets mm. so that you're not uh, training on future data and predicting past data. Right. But that's the idea, yes. Great point. Glad that you pointed that out there. So this has been a fascinating episode. I've loved it. It's been illuminating to hear so much about polars from you. You describe in such crisp, clear detail every aspect of what you're talking about and make it so easy to understand. So really appreciate you doing that, Marco. Before I let you go, do you have a book recommendation for us? We're doing fiction, nonfiction, like... Whatever. <laughs> you know, you can do one of each if you really want to. <laughs> let's, uh, let's be greedy and do that then. Take two. Okay, so... A uh, technical book, I think, uh, Programming Rust, uh, published by O'Reilly, is really good, uh, as is the Rust programming language. So, yeah, if you're a Python programmer, want to get into this, want to write your Polar's plugin, then uh, it's a really accessible way to get into the language. Uh, fiction, the last fiction book I remember really enjoying is called uh, All That's Left Unsaid by Tracy Lean, just about some Vietnamese... Uh, immigrants in Australia. This girl, her brother's been murdered, but her family, like, they're really distrustful of the police, really distrustful of the authorities, don't want to speak to anyone about anything, and she's trying to understand what's happened to her brother. Really good book. Recommend it. Great recommendations. Thank you, Marco. And for people who would like to follow you on your thoughts after this episode, how should they do that? If people want to follow me on social media, they can find me on GitHub at uh, Marco Gorelli. And uh, other social media, I'm on uh, LinkedIn and uh, Fostodon. Nice. Fostodon, the, one of the many, although I think probably the most popular, do you think, uh, kind of post-Twitter um, <laughs> social media places to be? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> People still call it Twitter, much to <laughs> Musk's angerment. Oh, well, um, yeah, on there, well, Mastodon is... I'm still not totally sure how this federation thing works, but I log on to fosterdon.com, okay? So I'm going to call it fosterdon. <laughs> nice. Cool. Well, maybe we can dig into that kind of stuff, the social media stuff, uh, this post-Twitter options, uh, maybe a dedicated episode to that at some point. Um, thank you so much, Marco. It's been great having you on the show. And thank you again for making the trip to London from Cardiff. And yeah, maybe we can check in again in a few years and see how narwhals, polars, whatever other exciting projects you've gotten yourself into by then are coming along. Sure, thanks for having me. Absolutely fascinating technical discussion with Marco today. In today's episode, he filled us in on how Polars excels at feature engineering and allows up to 100x speedups, especially on large data frames, thanks to lazy execution. He talked about how on string evaluation, such as for natural language processing, Pandas is optimized for this natively, so it outperforms the leading data manipulation libraries in Python, that is, NumPy and Pandas. He talked about how his Narwhals library allows other libraries, such as the popular declarative visualization library Altair, to be data frame agnostic, allowing support for polars without any detriment to Pandas users. He told us how he won $6,000 in prize money in the M6 forecasting competition by assuming that most teams would overfit their models to the training data. And he talked about how more paid roles, more mentorship, and active reach outs could increase diversity amongst open source software developers. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Marco's social media profiles, as well as my own, at superdatascience.com slash 815. Thanks, of course, to everyone on the Super Data Science podcast team. You've got our podcast manager, Yvonne Siebert, media editor, Mario Pombo, operations manager, Natalie Jaisky, researcher, Serge Massis, writers, Dr. Zara Karshe and Sylvia Ogwang, and our founder, Kirill Aramenko. Thanks to all of them for producing another dazzling episode for us today for enabling that super team to create this free podcast for you. I am so grateful to our sponsors. You can support this show by checking out our sponsors links, which are in the show notes and you yourself. If you're interested in sponsoring an episode, you can do that. You can find the details on how by making your way to johncrone.com slash podcast. Otherwise, please share, review, subscribe and all that good stuff. But most importantly, just keep on tuning in. 
I'm so grateful to have you listening and I hope I can continue to make episodes you love for years and years to come. Till next time, keep on rocking it out there and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.